Benvinguts, welcome to the inaugural lecture of the course 2015-16 at TVA. It's a pleasure to have with us Mr. Fatala Sismalsi, he's the Secretary General of the Union for the Mediterranean. He is going to talk about the Barcelona Declaration, 20 years after the Barcelona Declaration, the Union for the Mediterranean, Challenges and Opportunities, the title of his presentation. As probably you all know, 20 years ago in Barcelona, it happens a very important meeting that started the process of dialogue among the Mediterranean states, which he's going to explain to us. And uh, just me, let me know before uh, uh, Professor Kisak is going uh, to introduce uh, Mr. Uh, Sislamasi that this is the 11th uh, inaugural opening lecture at TVA. And this has been become a, a, a tradition uh, <coughs> that we have established at our institute, inviting uh, distinguished politicians and professionals involved uh, in the broad area of international relations. Uh, and uh, well, it's, uh, as I said, it's a, it's a pleasure uh, uh, for us to have uh, today uh, Mr. Fatala Sismasi. Uh, now Robert is going to introduce him. Right, well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, what I'm gonna do for just a couple of minutes is speak a little bit more generally about why this particular issue, why the Union for the Mediterranean is of interest to us today. Now, one of the most fundamental issues, one of the most fundamental concepts of international relations as we know is the border, the frontier, the division between mutually exclusive, autonomous, sovereign, territorial units. And for many times, when we look across land, these seem somewhat arbitrary, especially if we look at the way in which linguistic or social patterns are mapped onto them. Physical boundaries, it would seem, often seem to make sense. Physical boundaries, especially those that are rivers or even seas, they give us what we would consider something along the lines of an unambiguous territorial divide. But before the, lie, the laying of railways in the 19th century, Water was actually the most reliable and speedy method of communication, of transport. Water was not a barrier, but it was a facilitator of contact. My favorite example of this is the east of England, where the places to the north and to the east, the countries or the counties of Essex, Sussex, Norfolk, which today seem to harbor a lot of Euroscepticism, are historically much more connected to the Netherlands and to Belgium than any other part of the UK. If you look at their light, the names, the towns, the ships, the houses, the, everything about them, they look more similar to the Netherlands than they do to other parts of England or Scotland or Wales. But we're here today to talk about the Mediterranean. Today, as the result of industrialization, imperialism, and much more recently, European integration, we see a division between a wealthy and secure North, the European Union member states, and considerably low levels of income and higher degrees of insecurity on the southern states, the Arab states of the south. Every day we see migrants making perilous crossings to reach the European shores, give us the impression that the sea is a natural and substantial important frontier. But historically this was very different. The Mediterranean is the nexus of communication, commerce and culture for the people around its shores for thousands of years. One of the purposes of the Union for the Mediterranean, as I understand it, I think most broadly, which was founded in 2008 uh, on the basis of a longer political process, is to return to this sort of view of the Mediterranean, one in which peace and prosperity are shared equitably, and most importantly, that the governance of cooperation is managed by both sides, north and south, the countries of, of the entire Mediterranean shores. About a year ago, I was invited to the headquarters of the Union for the Mediterranean. Uh, they were reaching out to the local IR community and policymakers. And one of the things we were asked about were to talk and to think about issues that might energize and be of importance to the Union. The thing I mentioned, which I think is very important, is the, the scourge of youth under and unemployment, which sees both North and South acting the same. We see it as a catalyst for Arab revolutions and we see it also as the consequence of the crisis in Europe. This is the sort of thing which is important, identifying common problems and it's crucial to returning to these ideas to have a, a common destiny to solve them. So on this idea that the sea is something that connects us more than divides us, we are extremely privileged to have 
the ambassador uh, of the Secretary General of the, of the Union for the Mediterranean, His Excellency Ambassador Sigil Massey. Dr. Sigil Massey was appointed Secretary General in March 2012 and he was re-elected in December 2014. He is a Moroccan. His background is in international economic, international economic relations. He's, in his earlier parts of his career, negotiated a number of trade liberalization agreements between Morocco and the EU and with the United States and with other African and Arab states. From 1999 onwards, uh, he's held serious, seri sorry, senior positions in the foreign ministry of, of the government of Morocco. He's been the director of multi multicultural, multilateral, I should say, cooperation, the director of European affairs. He's been ambassador to the Barcelona Euro process. He's also been ambassador to the European Union and most recently ambassador to France, situated obviously in Paris. He, in the last uh, three years, has been here in Barcelona. The title of his talk is uh, in front of you, it's 20 years after the Barcelona Declaration, the Union for the Mediterranean Challenges and Opportunities. Ambassador, thank you for coming to eBay and the floor is yours. Thank you very much and um, <clears throat> thank you for um, the opportunity given to me to make a presentation, but beyond the presentation, I'm looking forward to the discussion with you um, about uh, the future of the Euro Mediterranean region and uh, where we are and where we are going. I think it is a good moment to be uh, raising such a subject and I'm very happy to do it here because uh, when we talk 20 years after the Barcelona process I think the majority in the room uh, are young people that look towards the future and uh, I don't know how far you are from 20 years I'm very far from it but uh, we are basically talking about something that is uh, related to your lives. And I think it's very important to be very well connected to this human dimension of everything that we are going to be talking about. I'm very much aware that um, we talk a lot about institutions, we talk a lot about the challenges, we tend to present them sometimes as um, a little bit uh, theoretical or a little bit complicated, but at the end of the day, we are talking about the lives of the citizens. And this is why I'm so happy to be given this opportunity to give this opening lecture here at the uh, eBay, because I believe that uh, uh, youth, and you refer to youth and employment as a, one of the key challenges, we'll come back to it later, but youth is certainly a major uh, dimension, and I would call it also a major asset uh, for the region. Uh, there are two other reasons why it is important for us to be discussing this subject today is that we are uh, 20 years after this very important declaration of Barcelona. And by the way, I invite you all to read uh, the Barcelona declaration. I think that uh, there would not be much to change regarding the main messages, the main topics, the main um, objectives of uh, peace, stability, and security, and development in the region. So we are today faced with the important task and challenge of taking stock of where we are <clears throat> and defining the way forward for the next 20 years and beyond, of course. The third reason, and I, you mentioned it, uh, Robert, is that we are uh, witnessing a lot of uh, challenges uh, that I think if you open any newspaper or any TV, you see all these um, very important challenges of uh, security, terrorism, radicalism, migration, refugees. Um, and I think that more than ever, if that leads to any conclusion or any type of uh, um, remark concluding remark, it would be that we need more than ever to work together as a region, to work together as countries, and to make sure that the global Euro-Mediterranean region is in a positive process 
of enhancing cooperation for the sake of promoting stability, security for all. What I intend to do, uh, and I uh, came here uh, with a, a team from the UFM Secretariat, uh, uh, Sergi Faré, Christina Giner, and Nouria Jové, two former students, by the way, of these surroundings. Um, I think that, uh, and I, they're here to back me up in case you have a question and I cannot answer, they will help me answering. But I think that what I intend to do is to give a broad overview of where we are as a union for the Mediterranean, especially the activities of the Secretariat here in Barcelona. I think it's important because uh, it's important to see also through the different activities that I will be showing, the assets that the region has, uh, the success stories on which we can build, and the uh, positive agenda that exists and can exist. I am, as a citizen from the South, I can tell you I refuse categorically to consider that our region is only the negative agenda. We have a positive agenda, and we have this because we have people. We have youth, and we have people with whom we can work to make the region be on a much more dynamic uh, um, process. So how does this work? Should I just click? Yes. So what I will be going through is a presentation of the Mediterranean region. There are some slides that are more important than others, uh, but I will just go uh, over it. And then, of course, if you have any questions, don't hesitate. I will put my watch here because when diplomats start talking, they don't stop, uh, especially from the southern countries. <laughs> um, just to uh, recall what you, I think you already know, which is the uh, composition of the Euro-Mediterranean uh, family, uh, which is the 43 member states. 43 member states, that's 28 from the European Union, plus 15 from Southern and Eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean. I'm saying the 28 from the European Union because if the European Union becomes 29, then it's automatically the 29th become a member of the UFM. So take, for example, just for the sake of the country that is not one of the southern and eastern countries, because otherwise it just shifts. For example, uh, a few years back, Croatia, Croatia was, we used to say, 27 and 16, because Croatia went from uh, being non-member of the EU, but Mediterranean country, into member of the EU. So it then became 28 and 15. But if you take Serbia, for example, if Serbia enters the EU, then it will become 29 and uh, uh, 15. So to whichever uh, country the European Union enlarges, then it automatically becomes a member of the European Union, of the Union for the Mediterranean. Our mission, I think it's very clear, is to enhance regional cooperation. And we have three main priorities, which is youth employability and inclusive growth women empowerment, and sustainable development and infrastructure. It's interesting to uh, just uh, uh, zoom a little bit on these three priorities because the idea is very simple. To say, if you have youth employability, if you have uh, youth finding jobs and living in countries or in a region where you have inclusive growth. Inclusive growth means that you have less social and territorial inequalities. So if you have that, and if you have a woman empowerment environment and ecosystem, and if you live in a, in a region where connectivity is ensured through infrastructure, and you have sustainable development, if you have all those you are likely not to have terrorism, not to have migration, not to have radicalism, or at least much less. And this is why these are three main priorities that target 
some of the root causes of what are today's challenges that we're facing security-wise. So to take the first um, picture, just for us to understand, and this is an interesting uh, counterintuitive uh, slide, is to say that if you look at the GDP and if you look at the world as it is, you will find that more or less between the Americas, UFM plus Africa, and the whole Asian continent, you are looking at figures that are similar, more or less. Okay? And that's interesting to say that we have three more or less equal blocks. Mm -hmm. Of course, these are the figures of today. Uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot know precisely what the figures will be in 20 years uh, because of the growth rate that you can have. But this is where we are today, and I think it's interesting to position it like this in order to know the strengths, the potential strengths of the region. But this is the slide that I would like to zoom on most today. And for you to keep, and by the way, we will provide you with this presentation so that you will uh, have a look at it uh, uh, at the later stage as well. But I think it's interesting to see that we have some challenges and opportunities on which we can build a strategy. First of all, youth employment is very important. It's important in the South. I know it's important also in the North. I know it's an important issue also in Europe. And I think that this uh, is one of the topics that makes this issue of youth employment being a common topic for the Euro-Mediterranean region. Women in labor market also is a common challenge Yes, it's a challenge in the south, but it is also a challenge in the north. Water scarcity might be more an issue in the south, but it can have an impact. It can have an impact on the north as well. Water scarcity is a serious problem in the southern Mediterranean and beyond in Africa. But mind you, the, 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 you have to remember that today we have uh, migrants or refugees that, uh, that cross uh, different countries for, uh, because they are fleeing from conflict zones or because they are fleeing from poverty, we might have, if it's not already the case, what we can call climate change migrants. And water scarcity is one of them. So this is just to show how important water scarcity is in order also to address the issue of mobilities. Very weak regional economic integration, that's a very serious challenge in the region. By 2030, we will have 80 people living in urban areas. That's also a very, very important uh, dimension because that brings us to the very conception of what uh, uh, urban development should be in order to prepare for this. All the energy-related uh, challenges, uh, and especially the consumption, that not only go with the uh, increase of the population, but go also with the increase of the economy and the industrial activity. And of course, all the uh, issues related to CO2 emissions and the fact that beyond on the different um, ways to see the migrant slash refugee issues today. We all know, and the figures can be uh, challenged, but challenged uh, to the upper level, that Europe needs workforce, and that also puts it in perspective uh, in, towards the capacity of the Euro-Mediterranean region to organize itself in order to, to address the, the needs of the labor market for the sake of competitiveness. So we have challenges. The increased poverty and development gaps that of course lead us to what we see today, radicalism, migrations, and all sorts of difficult situations, and also opportunities, because there are a lot of opportunities, the global competitiveness, the market size, and the better 
use of skilled mobility. In order to do that, there has always been a feeling that the region should organize itself. We will not go very much back in history because it will be a little bit too boring and too long, but just to kickstart, as you were saying, to the 1995 Barcelona Declaration at the Juan Carlos on the other side of the city. And by the way, this is just in front of the Palau de Pedralbes where we are uh, and where you are all welcome to visit us uh, and uh, we are always very happy uh, to see you. 1995 and then the, uh, I, I thought it was going to be the, the, the history of, how do you go back? Come on, Julian, I think. Uh, anterior. Uh, again, anterior. Okay. No, I thought there was going to be the three, the three dates of... Uh, but anyway, just to say that 1995 is today the 20th anniversary, uh, and of course in 2008 was the creation of the Union for the Mediterranean as a continuity and I'm insisting on the word as a continuity to the Barcelona process. In 2010, the Secretariat was established here in Barcelona, and here we are today. So coming back to what the uh, Union for the Mediterranean in particular is organized and how it's organized. We have a, a, a governance of Co-ownership, you mentioned this, and it's very important that the Union for the Mediterranean exists because the North and the South want to work together, want to decide together, want to have a common agenda. It is not the area where the North, the EU, or any country of the EU is defining its strategy towards the South. They have their own the EU has the European neighborhood policy, and each country, Spain, France, Germany, whichever, has its strategy towards any given country in the region. But the Union for the Mediterranean exists because there is a willingness to try to build something together with this feeling of co-ownership, north and south, at political level, with 20 ministerial meetings that took place since 2008. The co-presidency to uh, enact uh, and embody this co-ownership feeling is today uh, uh, led by the European Union uh, from the northern part and Jordan from the south. I don't know if there are any Jordanians in the room. No? Okay, I'll try some other country later. Uh, but. These are, these are two co-presidencies. It's very important because it's always north and south. And by the way, this is exactly why the Secretariat is in Barcelona, north, and the Secretary General, your humble servant, is from the south, Morocco. And so it will be uh, uh, the, the good news for you in Barcelona is that the Secretariat will always be in Barcelona. The bad news for me is that the Secretary General will not always be me. I will have to leave, but that's the life of the institutions. The executive body uh, uh, is the senior official meeting that uh, takes place every two or three months. It's composed of the ambassadors of the 28, sorry, the 43 uh, countries. The last time, the last senior official meeting took place last week in Luxembourg. Why Luxembourg? Because it's the EU presidency. And so the senior official meetings normally take place alternatively in Brussels and in Barcelona, alternatively. But sometimes the EU presidency takes the initiative to say, we would like to host one of these meetings. This is why the last meeting was held in Luxembourg. And the Secretariat here in Barcelona, one Secretary General, six Deputy Secretary Generals, three from the North, three from the South on a rotating basis. For the moment, the three from the North are from Italy, France, and Portugal. And the three from the South are from Israel, Palestine, and Turkey. 
By the way, this is the only institution where in its governance, we have two deputy secretary generals, one from Israel and one from Palestine. I think it's worth noting because here also it's one of the specificities of uh, the uh, UFM. Within the Secretariat, we have uh, 60 people, it's a team of 60 people, composed of uh, diplomats, uh, experts, project managers, and others. We are from 20, 20 to 25 countries and different institutions. It's a very interesting uh, setup. I must admit, uh, coming from a diplomatic background, we are used to being only between diplomats uh, in an embassy. If you're in an embassy, well, most, you are mostly surrounded by, 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 by diplomats. It, at the Secretariat, it's very interesting because we have financial experts. We have project managers. We have people, engineers. And it's the connection between these different profiles that makes the decision-making process interesting because everybody has an angle. Everybody has a, a way of seeing things. But the end of, at the end of the day, what is important is doing things. Our main objective <clears throat> is to act on two main pillars. And then I will uh, describe a little bit the activities of the two main pillars. The first one is to be a platform for regional dialogue and policy dialogue. This is a very important activity is how do you bring together all the stakeholders that are working, that are working, that are not waiting for things to improve in the region. They are not waiting for uh, peace treaties to be signed. They are stakeholders of development that are working on the ground, NGOs, private sector, civil society, students, and so many other stakeholders that on a daily basis they are working, they need support, they need uh, uh, encouragement, they need brokering solutions for the challenges they are facing, and one of our main activity is precisely to be this platform for regional dialogue, to bring together the different partners and stakeholders. Let me, for example, at this stage, tell you that I am surprised every day to see how much financial availabilities exist way beyond what we can imagine. Today, money is not a problem. Intuitively, you can think that the issues of the region require or would require uh, um, money-related solutions. If the only problem was to say, if we go from 50 to 100, it will solve all the different problems, then that would be the easy uh, uh, solution. Money is available. International financial institutions are available and mobilized. I want to recognize here and acknowledge the, 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 the positive will and willingness of these different institutions. First, the European Commission. I want to acknowledge the role played by the European Commission in the region with a, a very strong political uh, commitment and ambition. But also IFIs, EIB, EBRD, World Bank, uh, and uh, more nationally, IFD in France, uh, KFW in Germany, uh, IAC in, in Spain, and others. There are a lot of development agencies, international financial institutions. On the other side, you have a lot of stakeholders who have a lot of initiatives. But sometimes, they lack like the connection with the financial availabilities. So it is important for institutions such as the UFM to play the role of platform so that these connections can take place for the sake of the second pillar of our activity, which is the development of regional projects with socioeconomic impact, to actually show that from the political decision and speeches to the regional cooperation platform, to the concrete projects that we can actually do things on the ground and make a difference, even if the difference is 
at the beginning minor, but it can improve, increase, and amplify. This is the bet that we are doing at the UFM. And these are the results that once you take this approach, you see what I call the scope of the possible. What I said earlier at the beginning, the positive agenda, the existence of the positive agenda, that we have had 18 high-level conferences on all the subjects that are of importance to the, uh, uh, to the region. Let me just here refer to the interreligious dialogue with the very successful conference we held in July in 2015, last July, gathering all the institutions uh, of the, the, the regions working on intercultural and interreligious dialogue. Very important to consolidate and to strengthen the reality, which is that what unites us is much more important than what divides us. But it has to be said, it has to be enacted, and it has to be acknowledged and amplified by all. We've had a lot of senior official meetings. These are, I told you about our executive body meeting. We've had hundreds of expert forums and roundtables and 5,000 stakeholders and more that we have gathered. And all that in order to manage to uh, label, because we go through the labeling of 33 label projects, regional label projects. And you can see the increase, because once you go with a methodology, you can see that the increase is exponential. And this is what I call the demonstration of the scope of the possible and the positive agenda. Uh, I will not bother you with this. This is just to explain how a project is uh, managed in its life cycle. And maybe if one of you at some stage become, after a vacancy appears in the Secretariat and you are becoming a project manager at the UFM Secretariat, this is what you will be doing from the assessment, identification, to the labeling, and of course the monitoring. I will go directly to this one, just to give you a more a detailed zoom on the 33 label project that are worth 5 billion euros in the different sectors of our activities with the different uh, regions of uh, the uh, UFM. But most importantly, and it's what you can see uh, at the bottom of the slide, that we work with different type of uh, stakeholders. Uh, and that is really something that we encourage very strongly, that it's not only government to government, it's government-led process, but it's open to all the other stakeholders in the region because this is where the strength is, where the strength is and where we find the uh, creativity, the initiative, and the impulse to build on this positive agenda. So I was saying that we have the three main priorities. Let's just zoom a little bit on each one of them, and uh, that will be almost the end of my presentation. Uh, I already mentioned the figure of 28% of youth unemployment. Keep this in mind. 2.8 million young people enter their labor market each year. This is a very important figure, and that's only the South. If we include the North, it's even a higher figure. And that shows, and here I'm taking my hat as an economist, this shows that we have a structural challenge to face. Because with uh, uh, average growth in Europe of around 1%, 1, 1.5, whatever percentage can be, it's very difficult to think of a quantitative growth of employability. So the challenge in the future is not only to have growth, because you need growth, but you have to have a qualitative assessment of the policies to be implemented so that the jobs that you are creating correspond to the education that you are providing. In this connection, I think, is the major challenge, both for Europe and for the uh, southern Mediterranean countries. 
We need also to make sure that there is a serious development of SMEs, because it's in the SMEs that you find the most, the highest rate for the job creation. We all know that not everybody can work either for the government or for the big companies. So the SMEs, and actually you can even go as down as the, uh, uh, I don't know how it's called in English, the TPE, the, 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 when you're uh, self-employed, uh, uh, where you create your own company, you actually have the capacity to, when you finish university, not to necessarily go to work somewhere, but actually to create your own company. For that, the strategy for the UFM is clear, job creation, development of SMEs within the framework of a common Euro-Mediterranean strategy, and to zoom on such is issues such as vocational training and higher education in view of a better employability and to also encourage the mobility of the different uh, uh, young students. The second priority is women empowerment. Again, women empowerment is essential if we want to reach our global political objectives. I think it is uh, uh, worth stating that you need to have a strategy that also relies on a category of people that represent 50, 50, and maybe more of the population. So this is why the figures of, you, uh, of women unemployment is still too high and the capacity to bring it uh, to a much more acceptable uh, and normal rate is essential. In short, for us, women empowerment is an indicator of development. And as an indicator of development is also a very important asset for stability, for security, and for regional integration. This is why we have a regional agenda on gender equality, and of course we see it through different angles and essentially linked to labor market, entrepreneurial networks, and the mainstreaming of the gender approach within all our activities. Sustainable development is also a big issue as we are moving towards the uh, COP21 in Paris in a few weeks. Uh, and the good news for us is that the COP21, which is the uh, uh, conference of the parties for the climate change, is going to be in Paris, one of uh, the uh, UFM member states, in December 2015. And in December 2016, it will be in Morocco. So for a period of two years, we will have presidencies of the COPs UFM-related countries, and so we have the possibility to also build on this uh, positive agenda. Here, it's very obvious we, we are facing the challenge of climate change to work also on urban development. Remember the figure that we showed earlier, 80% of people will live in urban areas by 2030, 30, 30, which brings the sustainable urban development strategy as one of the most important strategy in our activities. Continue to amplify the depollution efforts in the region and access to water management. Remember what I told you earlier about the importance of water scarcity. And of course, continue working on a subject that is very important for all Europe and southern countries, renewable energies and energy efficiency. In short, <clears throat> Just to summarize a little bit the different uh, parameters that I refer to. First of all, an institution like the UFM exists only by the political will of its 43 countries. So the, 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 the institution exists because the governments want it. And we are the expression of the political commitment of 43, 43 countries. Second, this political will, this political commitment has been designed in a way to favor and to encourage 
co-ownership. I insist on this word because I think it is very important to acknowledge and to enact the fact that nobody can solve the problem or the issue of somebody else by his or her own decision. It's about working together and setting common agendas, setting common priorities, understanding each other, and building together a better future. So co-ownership is very important. Variable geometry is a methodology that we use because being 43, it's not always obvious to work on the different projects with such a large number. So the variable geometry is the key of that we have chosen so that we can work pragmatically, beginning, for example, a project with four, five, six countries, and then enlarging the scope to others. By the way, we did not invent this uh, methodological concept. The European Union itself, being one of the most if not the most advanced regional integration process, has uh, forms of variable geometry. Not all countries are members of Schengen, not all countries are members of Euro. So there's an adaptation to certain realities. So variable geometry is important. Regional and sub-regional integration is key because the southern Mediterranean region is still uh, weakly uh, integrated and we are working to strengthen uh, this integration because we believe that it's a key solution for the future. We work on the basis of dynamic and flexible partnerships because the name of the game is not becoming a bureaucracy, it's not becoming uh, a self-ambitioned institution. The name of the game is to be partnering, is to build on synergies, coordinations, and complementarities with so many other institutions that exist and we are very happy with all the different partnerships that we have been uh, developing and I think that also helps us to move forward. Concrete projects because I believe in concrete and tangible results. I say very often uh, that we will not build the Mediterranean by doing speeches. We will do it by acting on the ground, by involving the different actors of development with us and with all the stakeholders in order to actually show that there is a difference. It is complicated. I know it's complicated and it's complicated to apprehend, but it is the way forward and this is why I uh, continue believing in the implementation of these concrete projects and I'm sure that we can develop so much more. And of course, we have to, as any uh, institution, we have to adapt to the realities. Uh, you cannot uh, have, uh, for example, priorities set in 95 that you don't uh, adapt them to uh, the realities of 2015. Even 2008, between 2008 and 2015, there have been so many changes. There has been the so-called Arab Spring, an expression that I don't like, but I use it just for the sake of explaining my point. There has been the uh, financial crisis in Europe and the tensions uh, around the, the euro. There has been today what we are seeing on the refugee uh, crisis and uh, the um, growing magnitude of uh, phenomena such as uh, terrorism and radicalism. There are changes and all the institutions, all the stakeholders have to adapt to these changes in order to adapt uh, the uh, responses and the solutions to uh, these uh, evolutions. So we are in a constant adaptation of our uh, uh, activities, but this is why our focus is so much on job creation for young people because we believe that it is there the, prime, the, 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 the main uh, uh, challenge and the main issue to be addressed so that we can actually contribute to the building of our region. And this is just to conclude uh, by saying that we are looking, uh, whilst we are um, commemorating the 20th anniversary of the Barcelona process and the 8th anniversary, in a way, of the Union for the Mediterranean, 
But one has to look way beyond uh, and not uh, just uh, look at the past and uh, have a vision and an ambition for the next 20, uh, 30 years and to build on the existing challenges, on the existing opportunities. And in the opportunities, I would like to mention the African dimension because the Mediterranean, of course, has its uh, uh, specificity and the Union for the Mediterranean has its geographical scope. But it is not because we have a geographical scope that we are closing our doors within this scope. We have to look also beyond our region, and I believe that this link with uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is so important. We are at a time also where the European Union is redesigning its neighborhood policy, and the document will be issued in a few weeks, and I believe that this document will also show that the European Union also is adapting to the priorities, is expressing its political commitment to the region, and certainly expressing its uh, commitment to continue working and teaming up within the UFM with its other partners to uh, 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 enhance this uh, regional cooperation that is so important and that is, as is written uh, at the bottom of this slide, more important than ever. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to take any question you would like to raise. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for, for your presentation and for explaining us the development the activities and the challenges of the Union for the Mediterranean. This is clearly a, a new generation, new class of international organization, much more, as you explained, and much more active in network building and making partnerships that are creating a, a bureaucracy. And uh, I think it's uh, very interesting also for our master's uh, uh, programs in international relations and international security uh, to get to know how these uh, new organizations of this uh, case, the uh, Union for the Mediterranean is developing uh, as a new international organization with uh, these uh, challenges and new ways of uh, uh, operating. Or probably being based here in Barcelona and being the, probably the, the, the most important international organization in, in based in Barcelona is also very interesting. Uh, for us to have this uh, connection with eBay, uh, the Personal Institute of International Studies, and, and to look for uh, different ways of, uh, of uh, collaboration also for our students. It's an important place for internships, or for who knows, uh, maybe also uh, jobs in, in the future, as we, we have in the, uh, some students, uh, former students at the eBay did uh, uh, internships at the Union you know, of the Mediterranean in the, in the previous years. Well, I, I thank you, you for, for the, the the lecture and let's now open for, for, for questions or comments that you may you may have. Please. The floor is yours. Yes, please. Um, what do you think is the, the greatest success and also the greatest failure of the UFM and what we learned from it? Short and concise and uh, <clears throat> The biggest success is, uh, are the projects that we are implementing. Uh, it was not obvious to be successful in uh, having regional cooperation projects because the region is, um, um, as I said, uh, the level of uh, regional cooperation is very low and we're trying to enhance it. So we had to test the uh, feasibility, the capacity, the added value of regional uh, cooperation projects. And let me give you two examples of projects just for the sake of uh, illustrating my, my words and then I will answer on the failure. Uh, one of them is the Euro Mediterranean University of Fez, which is and it's good to say it here because uh, I invite you as eBay to have uh, links. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Nuria, who is the uh, project manager of the Fez University, can, can build bridges on that. But this is a university that is based in Fez, that is based in Morocco, that has started working and that will be officially inaugurated next year, but it started working with some masters and some PhDs which aims to truly 
embody the principle of mobility and of being from the Euro-Mediterranean region. I mean, my hope is that one day you will not make a difference where you come from within the university because there are only students from the same region and then you build the region in the, in the minds of people, okay? Uh, and it also aims to address uh, the employability issue so, so that the, um, the, the, the qualifications and the skills are adapted to the, the labor market. So I think we are very proud to see uh, the uh, regional enthusiasm around this university. And clearly, when we talk about the important, uh, importance of youth and youth mobility and youth education and youth employability, this is one of the flagship projects. The second success story that I would like to mention, uh, I will not mention the 33 of them because they're not all success stories, by the way, because they are, some are still work in progress. But the second I wanted to refer to is the uh, urban development um, pro project. And here, this is a success story because it shows how a good governance of uh, the global cooperation ecosystem can work. Because we have a consortium of uh, financial institutions who, which was created in order to finance and uh, follow different urban development projects that are being implemented in the region. And it put together the financial institutions, the governments, and the local authorities. Because when you talk about urban development, you're talking about the mayor, the region, and the uh, collectivité locale. And this triangle worked well. And we have selected today 15 urban development projects Three of them are already labeled, they are in the 33. 12 are under process of being labeled. And beyond these 15, we have at least, I would dare say, like 20 or 25 additional projects coming into the pipeline. So we have triggered, through this project, we have triggered a methodology that proved to, to be working. And this is exactly the kind of toolkit that we are looking for in order to show that we can actually broker solutions and implement concrete results. If I had to talk about weaknesses rather than failure, uh, I think the, the main weakness is this low level of regional integration. Uh, I would love to see the day where the figures of regional integration in the southern countries are significantly increasing. We conducted a study last year saying, okay, if the UFM was um, uh, an economic zone. How would the flow be distributed within the zone? And the figures are the following. 90%, 9-0, within the EU. 9% between EU and South. And 1% only between the South. I would like, because life teaches you to be very pragmatic, uh, so it's easy to make a speeches about the importance of regional integration. But the reality is that it is not progressing. So I would like this 1% to become 2%, <laughs> and then 3%, and we go up from there. The very pragmatically, but very uh, 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 from, with a result-oriented approach, and this is why we are trying to uh, put all our energy on these regional cooperation efforts. Sometimes these regional cooperation efforts may not appear in the statistics because these are the trade statistics, but certainly there are some dynamics that can be triggered from there. So I would say that the, the, the uh, regional integration is still a weakness that we are working on because I think it is essential. You know, uh, first of all, I think we have to recognize today more than ever that there is not one challenge that can be uh, solved nationally. I think we have seen, the demonstration is very clear now, 
sometimes tragically clear that the challenges are regional. So you are talking migration, you know, if you are talking terrorism, if you are talking radicalism, all the big challenges of today, they are regional. Think of how the Syria crisis impacted on Slovenia. Yeah? So you can imagine the process of connection, interaction, and of course, so many other countries. So clearly, this is today uh, uh, acknowledged and enacted. The second thing that is acknowledged also is that if you don't go to the problems, the problems come to you. That also is very clear. If you don't go to the problem, the problem come to you. So our efforts, our joint efforts, UFM, European Union, governments, all stakeholders, is to work together, dealing with our challenges, and dealing with it, of course, addressing the uh, security and short-term challenges, but also dealing with the root causes of the issues, and dealing with, dealing with those basing also our activities on the assets that we have. I see a lot of assets in the region. Uh, whenever I fly, for example, to any of the country of the south, from the airport of Barcelona, taking this wonderful airline that is welling and that flies all over the, 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 the place, I see businessmen in planes all the time going to Casablanca, going to Tunis, going to Cairo, going to Jordan, going to Istanbul, going to whatever. There are business people, there are NGOs, there are young people, students that are exchanging. So we have assets. So we have to build on that to address this weakness of regional integration because I believe it's really a very important uh, um, um, issue and a very important uh, objective for us. Yes, Well, I was agreeing with you until the last second. <laughs> because for me, the lack of development is fundamental. Uh, I think that when we look at the challenges that are in front of us, and we have to address them at three levels. First of all, there are the root causes of the problems, okay? There's the Syrian refugee, but beyond that, the real problem is Syria. Uh, you have uh, problems in Lampedusa, but the problem is Libya. Uh, you have, uh, so addressing the root causes of these political issues is essential. Having said that, it is not today within the Euro nor for the Mediterranean that these root causes are addressed by choice and decision of the member states. And that there are other institutions that are dealing with it and other formats that are dealing with it. But that does not mean that we don't recognize the fact of the need to address the root causes. The second level is the cooperation uh, between the countries. I believe that 
when you look at uh, the, the different uh, challenges that we refer to, the need for strengthened cooperation between all countries uh, is important. We see that today, for example, that when you have uh, Syrian refugees that go from Syria, obviously, uh, and that end up in Slovenia, they pass seven or eight countries. So the need for cooperation between the countries, exchange of information, exchange of data, is essential. And of course, is being taken care of, but it's also very important to continue strengthening this cooperation. The same for the fight against terrorism and the fight against extremism. Exchange of information, exchange of data, exchange of intelligence uh, data is crucial. So cooperation is very important. And the third layer, and the third action is development. Because as I said, you need to give a positive perspective to youth, to the population, to women, so as the future looks a brighter future. So what we believe at the UFM is building on the development agenda with a, a, a major involvement of the stakeholders enables to participate actively, I'm not saying solving, but participate actively in addressing this development agenda and the enhancement of the cooperation. I believe that we have to build also on the existence of our assets. And I do not believe that we can limit the whole region to only the issues of extremism and terrorism and illegal migration, because that would not be fair to the thousands, millions of people who are working and working very intelligently and very proactively. Look at the Nobel Prize that was given to the Quartet recently in Tunisia. What better signal can the international community give to a success story? A success story by uh, 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 stakeholders in Tunisia that put together their efforts to defend their country and to look towards the future. These are the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the assets on which we have to build our, uh, um, our strategies on. And this is why I consider that the role of these different activities that we are promoting as one of the mirrors, reality mirrors of our region showing that what brings us together in terms of common interests and common activity is much stronger than what can potentially divide the north of the Mediterranean from the south. And we will continue doing so because I believe in that. The name of the game is working together. Uh, it's working together. I'd like to see one plus one, one, plus one equals three and four. Uh, for example, uh, next week uh, we're going to uh, Valletta in Malta for the EU Africa Summit on Migration, where the UFM will be observer, but uh, we are part of uh, the, the, the institutions uh, invited and we will be participating in the, in the debates. I think that it's very important to, to, to work together uh, and not to have a, a vision that is oriented towards the institution, but a vision that is oriented towards people, okay? How can you in the room be better, not me, from the institutional point of view? And that is uh, the most important, and I think there's ample scope for uh, uh, institutions working together. This is synergy is the name of the game.
For the running costs, uh, we have um, the financial support by the member states that provide us uh, uh, their financial support to the to the secretary for our running activities. And for the projects, <coughs> we have on each, for each product we do fundraising uh, activities. But as I said, uh, uh, when you have good projects, when you have um, well uh, conceived and well packaged projects that also uh, are endorsed by uh, the, the different uh, uh, constituencies so that it is a priority for them. Frankly, I have to tell you that we don't have a lot of difficulties in finding uh, the funds. The difficulty is, of course, in the procedures because there are always some procedures to be uh, respected and it's normal. Uh, but uh, and the effort that we have to do to uh, put together um, the, the, the positive energies by many countries together, because as I said, we work on regional projects, not on national projects. Uh, it's um, we are not here in uh, at the Secretariat in Barcelona in the uh, easiest uh, uh, aspect of uh, the cooperation work. Uh, I know that my colleagues in other institutions dealing with bilateral issues maybe have, a, have a, an easier uh, time because you have a budget line and then you have one person deciding from each end and, and that's it. We may have the hard work which is building the cooperation but I believe that it's also the, uh, the attractiveness of uh, the work that we are conducting uh, and the, um, the strategic interests of developing such uh, regional initiatives and it works. It, wo it doesn't work all the time I have to admit sometimes we are faced with uh, difficulties sometimes we we have uh, we have uh, uh, failures but uh, uh, in general, I would say that uh, I'm uh, very positively encouraged by the results that I'm seeing on the ground and even with the financial support that we receive from the different financial institutions. Right. Uh, just before the ambassador answers that, if anyone has class at two o'clock, which is in ten minutes' time, if you would like to leave, it's much easier to leave. I understand that we've uh, run over. If you could just take this opportunity now, and then we'll have that can be the final question, and then we can move on. But if, if everyone's okay, everyone in the room needs can stay here. That's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I think that there is um, a growing consensus on the need to strengthen regional integration uh, as a whole. Uh, people recognize the importance of regional integration, recognize the importance of region building because the challenges are regional and they call for regional solutions. And so I do not see, from where I stand, I do not see this lack of interest that you were uh, potentially referring to. I see rather the opposite that uh, we are encouraged to continue working towards the strengthening of this uh, regional integration. 
They may be because we are talking about 43 countries. Uh, even if we consider the South uh, Mediterranean and the East uh, Mediterranean, there may be different situations here and there. Uh, but uh, the overall uh, dynamics have to be global. Uh, what we do, uh, to be pragmatic, because this is always uh, what is in our methodology, is to work on sub-regional integration. For example, we have a lot of activities within the framework of the 5 plus 5 group. Uh, the 5 plus 5 is the five Euro southern European countries and the five North African countries. Um, we also base, work sometimes on the basis of the Agadir Agreement, which uh, uh, four countries of the south are part of, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, and Jordan. So we try to use also some frameworks of sub-regional frameworks such as those in order to move forward. The whole idea is to show that if you showcase the added value of regional cooperation, then you create a positive spillover effect that can then bring others on board. And I think that it, at the end of the day, it proves to be interesting for all, especially that a lot of uh, donors, for example, in international financial institutions, would like to see this overall picture of the region and overall uh, um, strategy. And then you can decline it, obviously, by country or by uh, groups of country, but people tend to like to have this umbrella vision of where are we going globally. But I understand the, 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 the nuances that you are putting in your questions. Let's collect uh, some final questions. I see one there, another here. Please go. First about your question, um, obviously I'm not here to talk about the EU. Uh, you will have to invite somebody from the EU to answer the, the question directly. But what I can tell you is uh, enlarging the markets uh, through regional integration, through free trade, through a lot of uh, initiatives is very important. Enlarging the market to give uh, the capacity to build on uh, um, economies of scale, uh, to, 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 to broaden the perspective of competitiveness. So, I believe it's very important. When I was uh, the CEO of the Moroccan Agency for Investment, for example, for international investment, I used to go to China uh, to attract Chinese investment into Morocco. But how can you uh, interest big, large Chinese companies for a market of 35 million people, uh, which they consider as very small? But when you talk to them about the broader perspective, whether it's Africa or North Africa or re-export to Europe, then it becomes more important. So for international in investors, for, for businesses, enlarging the market is important. So this perspective is still on the agenda of the U Union for the Mediterranean, is to uh, increase the capacity, to increase the markets, to increase the opportunities. Having said that, uh, the way to do it uh, takes different paths because 
We have free trade agreements, and now there are discussions between the European Union and the thousand, uh, some thousand countries, such as Morocco and Tunisia, for what is called the DCFTAs, the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement. But there are a lot of discussions with the countries uh, in order to see exactly what would be the agenda, because then we were talking about services, we were talking about agriculture and other types of, of sectors that are a little bit more uh, sensitive to, 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 to for a decision to be taken. Uh, but this is one track. The other track is to improve the global environment of business, uh, uh, to, uh, to enable a more uh, convergence of uh, regulations, of rules, of uh, indicators, so that you can have a, a better environment and a more uh, business-friendly environment. And the third is the connection also between the people, the business people, and the, the, the different stakeholders in the uh, uh, trading uh, value chain, okay? So you need to have more contacts, and this is one of the things that we are, uh, for example, promoting within the framework of our private sector strategy, which is to put together the different uh, private sector representatives in order for them to partner on specific issues. So I agree with your comment that it should not be uh, with only winners and losers uh, uh, from one side or another, and I think that this has now uh, entered the culture also in the South to say, we are ready to go further, but not at any cost, okay? So I think this is, 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 uh, is integrated as a, in the strategies of the southern countries. But I think that we should also, if we want to reach this enlargement of the markets, not consider that trade is the only uh, uh, parameter for enlarging the market, that investment, and through investment, the creation of jobs that is very important because at the end of the day, what we want to do is create jobs and not only have trade uh, between uh, companies. For Erasmus, uh, youth mobility is clearly uh, an objective and uh, through the Fez University, through uh, at least 10 projects that we are uh, promoting, I didn't have time to enter into each single one of them, but I will be very happy to give you more details. We have at least 10 projects that promote student mobility directly or indirectly, okay, with an effect on the mobility, with the effect on the capacity for people to, uh, uh, to connect. Hmm? But we are aiming also to try to frame this into a larger uh, dimension um, project and program that would look like Erasmus, but uh, it would need to have another name connected to the realities and the history of the region, but there are plenty. Uh, and we are working on that uh, with our partners to try to, 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 to have something that would be more meaningful in terms of uh, impact, okay? Because I believe that it is very important to encourage these mobilities and by the way, uh, too often the mobilities are seen from, from the angle of 1,000 people going to the north. I would like to see also European students going into the south to have an exchange uh, uh, student program in some southern universities with, whom you, with which you would have a, um, a, a partnership agreements. And examples exist. As we are speaking, there are universities, I know from my home country, Morocco, but I'm sure in, uh, in others, in Jordan, in Egypt, and elsewhere, there are programs for which European and other type of uh, uh, North America, for example, coming into uh, North African or Mediterranean countries to have a semester or whatever. These mobilities are very important to also get to know the culture and to know the people. And, of course, we need to encourage also, let's not forget this dimension, the South-South mobility, because this is also very important if you want to uh, address the uh, regional integration in the South that we are talking about, then South-South mobility is also very important. Okay, thank you.
Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's conclude here. Uh, thank you. Thank you.